Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Free Radical Media Podcast. I am Eric Scott Picard, joined, as ever, by my co-founder and co-host, Patrick Ryan. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, tonight, we've got a we've got a good show uh, for you tonight, a show that I've been real excited about. Um, we have a representative from the Crime Think X Workers Collective. I'll uh, let me just read briefly from the uh, the masthead of their website. Um, <clears throat> the Crime Think X Workers Collective (CWC) is a decentralized anarchist collective composed of many cells which act independently in pursuit of a freer and more joyous world. Uh, this particular website is maintained by Crime Think Far East, which is primarily concerned with publishing and distributing literature and free propaganda, as well as occasionally circulating information about other cells' activities. So the collective um, <clears throat> has published a number of, of what's, um, what I personally consider uh, to be some of the best anti-capitalist analysis out there. Um, their previous work uh, that I, I, I certainly recommend, uh, the more recent uh, evasion and, uh, and, and work, um, work being one of, uh, certainly one of the best anti-capitalist uh, books I've ever read. Um, currently, their new project, To Change Everything, is a multimedia uh, project that we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. So, the collective's representative, how are you? I'm doing well tonight. I'm pleased to be speaking with y'all. Oh, it's good to have you. It's definitely good to have you. Um, I guess, first of all, um, well, first and foremost, why don't you tell us a little bit about what Crime Think is? Well, Crime Think is, uh, is many things. Chiefly, it is a, an un- umbrella organization for, for anonymous uh, theory and analysis and uh, and publishing generally from participants in struggles for, as the website says, a freer world, for a, another way of living, a way of living that is not constrained by any of the hierarchies or systems of control that are at play in the society we live in now. Um, Crime Think publishes a, a variety of print media. There's a podcast now. Um, we published, as you were mentioning earlier, we published uh, videos, and uh, and also we are participants in these struggles. Uh, that's that's the other aspect of this. We are we are engaged participants in struggles, making analysis by and for others like us. Right, right, right. It's not merely an intellectual pursuit. It's it's a participatory one, correct? Yes, exactly. And. Yeah. When I say struggles, I, I don't just mean people in black, black masks exchanging projectiles with the police. I, I mean all the different forms of struggle that the people might be engaged in. So if you are working some kind of ridiculous job that doesn't need your labor, but they, they won't let you read on the job and you're, you're sneaking around your boss to be able to read, that's also a struggle. That's also the same part of the same larger struggle for us to have our lives in our hands that, that takes place on a variety of different levels and scales in the society. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. What I've always liked about um, about your work is that it's engaged not merely with uh, political or economic um, uh, revolt or analysis. It's also engaged in a cultural c- critique. Um you know, it, it's definitely a, an all-encompassing sort of form of uh, analysis and philosophy, and and it's directly participatory, which is which is great. You know, it's a, it's a key anarchist value, I think. Right. Absolutely. And as you say, the the political or economic critiques are not an end in themselves. That the reason to have a political or economic critique is as a means to another end, which is to have fuller lives. And I think it's it's really important not to lose sight of that of that ultimate goal even as we analyze things or engage in these in these struggles for for me that's one of the reasons that the the poetry of of what we're doing is inseparable from the the analytical aspects or the or the the aspects that involve uh, um you know a more sh- setting more specific short term goals yeah, that's what immediately strikes you when you start reading any work from Crime Think is, uh, for lack of a better term, the, just the quality of the writing. 
You know, it is in very poetic language. I mean, it's something that really engages with people, you know, especially young people. You know, when I was younger, um, first reading, uh, you, you know, in my teens, etc., I started reading communist literature, um, you know, powering your way through Das Kapital, <laughs> you know, is, is kind right. of a, right. is, is, is kind of a, a chore. <laughs> but once you start, like, you know, looking at the, the work that you guys have put out, I mean, it's it's just um, the the quality of the writing's fantastic. It's engaging. It's interesting. It's it's fun to read. You know, it's very readable and understandable. You know, I think that's really part of the quality. You know, well, that's a that's a generous compliment that you're paying all the different participants in our projects. Uh, I I want to emphasize that none of us in beginning this undertaking were. Uh, high quality authors or designers or anything else that we've we've learned in the process of doing, which is a good example of you know of the the tremendous potential that all of us have to do whatever we put our minds to if we could get our hands free to do it. And when we put a lot of love and care into a project, whether it's in the writing or the design or the the distribution or something, the, the point that we are trying to make is not just the, the content of the project, but also the way that we do it is intended to show what all of us could be doing if we weren't constrained by the imperatives of the market, the, you know, the dictates of the, of the legal system. Sure. So that, that's a reason to invest ourselves in doing what we do well, sure. as you said. Sure, sure. Yeah, and it's totally evident through just the whole style. You know, that was the first thing that struck me. It was like, is this poetry? Is this philosophy? It's like it's completely genre defying, and that was that was one of the big selling points uh, with me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, certainly. <clears throat> and you're right. You know, by participating, that's how you gain this quality. That's how you gain those skill sets. You know, this will this will be. Um, Dated by the time this podcast goes to air, but just uh, uh, earlier today, I I had posted um, our first podcast. It's our year anniversary today, and uh -huh. um, congratulations! Thank you, thank you. Listening to that first podcast, though, it strikes you. I mean, we had no idea what the hell we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, it was very kind of an awkward, uh, awkward thing. The sound quality wasn't where it should be, and now listening to the work we're doing now. Um, you know, we, we've just learned by doing, by participating, you know, right. you know, which I, I think is kind of a key thing, you know, within the radicalism of, of crime think is that we don't know what the world's going to look like, <clears throat> um, you know, what they use the term after the revolution, <laughs> quote unquote, right? Right. That we don't have a program that, uh, that we want to fit everyone into. We don't have a model of what the future should look like, you know, built out of tinker toys or something that if we could just get our hands on the, on the steering wheel, that, you know, we could institute to, to mix a bunch of metaphors up that uh, rather we believe that if people learn by doing, if we were able to engage in this process, that we would learn how to go about it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that, that do it yourself ethic, uh, is, is, I mean, you know, crime think originated out of this do-it-yourself underground in the 1990s, and is is still very important, I think, as as a a hypothesis for how it is that human beings c can be free, can can become fully uh, self-realized, self-actualized beings. You know, and yeah, that's that's so interesting. I I want to I want to get to um, to change everything in a moment here, but you just were talking about you know in the 90s. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the collective, like how this kind of this this arose? Well, the first crime thing projects that you can see uh, came about as collaborations between people who met, as I referenced, in the do-it-yourself underground of the 1990s. So, and that that underground took many forms. There was punk on the one side. There was the, you know, these uh, zine networks, uh, people mm -hmm. corresponding, you know, mail art and various political movements at the time also sort of preceding the anti-globalization era. Um, the, you know, the first crime thing projects were collaborations between participants in, in this network that eventually uh, took on this 
this larger sort of amorphous form and and under that umbrella under the the crime think moniker have entered the 21st century even as many of those original networks have become outmoded in the internet era mm -hmm. yeah yeah sure okay um yeah all right so to change everything let's let's talk about this a little bit because it's a project that i've been uh I've been interested in for some time. I was really happy to get my hands on uh, on the PDF copy. <clears throat> uh -huh. um, you know, first of all, uh, the thing that strikes you is that it's um, just like everything you got you you put out. I mean, it's you know beautifully written. You know, um, a lot of beautiful images, um, and it's uh, it's in the same vein as like um, fighting for our lives, right? You know, that your your primer, which um, I, I think has probably been the introduction to anarchism for a anyone my age and younger. Um, I, who could tell <laughs> how many people were first introduced into anarchism from that uh, that particular flyer? I know there's tons of copies of it in, in existence, you know. Yeah, something like 650,000, I believe, yeah. were yeah. distributed before we finally uh, had to put it out of print and try to do something more up to date. And this, I think, this succeeds in that goal. Um, first of all, it's multimedia, you know, so you go to the website, you can download the PDF, you can, uh, there's an associated video, you can read the text and see the images on the site itself, and you can uh, order copies for distribution from the website as well. So it's, it is a multimedia project, right? Yeah, and there will also be an audio file version of it out shortly. It's made by the same crew that does the Crime Think podcast. So, um, yeah, in fact, it, it, it's it been a project that takes many different forms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's, uh, yeah. you know, that's the 21st century when uh, there are so many different kinds of media that really a project is not about a single form of the, the ideas or the data. It's It has to be about the way the different forms interact. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. You know, and, and tell me a little bit then about um, how the pro how how this new project came to be, and uh, what what are the goals, the intentions? Well, we knew that we had to replace uh, fighting for our lives with something else. When we did that project, it was our most ambitious project to date. In it, it debuted at the beginning of fall of 2002, uh, and the, you know you can you can read it and tell that the participants are sort of uh, you know idealistic, uh, starry-eyed youngsters who have who are just beginning to get a sense of their own power, you know, mm -hmm. which is a, a beautiful position from which to speak. And if that describes any of your listeners, I I encourage them to. Uh, to go ahead and do something ambitious and beautiful right now, speaking from where they are. Um, but a lot has happened since 2002. Uh -huh. uh, you know, when we made Fighting for Our Lives, we were in a world that seemed, uh, seemed pretty stable, actually. Departing from uh, capitalism and the, the rule of law, you know, for an, another value system was sort of a leap of faith. And it was something that, that, you know, I mean, there were people on the receiving end of all of those hierarchies and, and forms of violence, but um, from where we were situated, it seemed like something that one might do voluntarily also, that you might say, I, I oppose this, this society and its structures, I would like to create something else. Um, in the now 13 years since 2002, we have seen the apparent stability of that social order really shaken by a series of crises. Um, and and it, its future called into question, you know, by global warming, by financial catastrophe. Uh, you know, we are now seeing the revolutions that overthrow uh, governments of massive countries like Egypt and Ukraine. Um, we can be certain that there is more upheaval ahead. And I think this this sense that we are in a time of upheaval is penetrating in the lives of ordinary North Americans as well. So when we set out to write to change everything, we were trying to produce an updated overview of what the anarchist alternative is to the values of this hierarchical society for people who might be 
uh, realizing that this society as it is, is not going to persist forever. And, and so it's time for all of us, whether you consider yourself a radical or not, whether you're interested in the avant-garde or not, uh, it's, you know, even if you're only just concerned with your own well-being, it's time for all of us to start thinking about what it would mean to change everything, what another values, what another way of living could mean. And I think you're right. I think it is increasingly clear to people that that's what's happening. You know, we, we talk to people, uh, <clears throat> we talk to people, you know, various parts of the spectrum, you know, a lot of people are involved in, you know, what's called transformational culture, um, you know, people who are involved in like any kind of a DI, DIY movements, future technology, um, and then you're back to nature kind of philosophies. But everybody's saying the same core thing that this situation that we have today is untenable. You know, it is it is uh, it's reaching a point where it's going to collapse in on itself. Right. Yeah. You know? Very few people are pretending that the dominant order has a solution for that either. The, you, you don't hear any any you know government figures even acting like they have a, a solution for the the problems of climate change you know um their their only defense really for for this way of living is that nobody can imagine another but the reason that that's unimaginable is is simply because this state of affairs is forced on us by the most violent and heavily armed uh repressive apparatus that has existed in the history of the solar system at least uh, it's it's not you know there, there's no positive argument for this way of living. It's obviously not meeting the the needs of the majority, and it's not sustainable, as you say. Yeah, it's it's absolutely not sustainable. You know, <laughs> in anyone's estimation anymore, it's become very clear. You know, people people just don't have faith in these institutions anymore, and they shouldn't because it's right. become very clear that they well they don't they don't care about you. You know, right. Well, and I mean, the, it, there may be, I don't want to personalize the problem here and say that the problem is the authorities don't care about you because some of them may actually care about you. But as you say, the institutions themselves are not able to produce uh, well-being for the majority of people, which is a much more significant problem than having a person with a bad heart in a position of power. The people in power may have really good hearts, but from where we are situated on the receiving end of that power... It doesn't matter how good-hearted they are because they can do nothing for us with the, the apparatus that they're operating. Yes, yes. And, you know, you, you just made a, a perfect segue. Um, there are a lot of passages in the new project to change everything that I think are great jumping-off points for a conversation. <clears throat> um, one thing that struck me most is this particular passage here. This comes from page 9. Um the soldier obeys the general who answers to the president who derives his authority from the constitution. The priest answers to the bishop, the bishop to the pope, the pope to scripture, which derives its authority from God. The employee answers to the owner who serves the customer whose authority is derived from the dollar. The police officer executes the warrant signed by the magistrate who derives authority from the law. Manhood, whiteness, property at the tops of all these pyramids. We don't even find despots, just social constructs ghosts hypnotizing humanity. I think that's such a salient point that kind of gets lost. It, 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 it's a point that I've, I've made myself. What's driving this, this system isn't the individuals at the top, right? It is right. the social constructs that have been created <coughs> to maintain that system of unequal relations and power. Right. Exactly. You know, um, you know, and that's a point that, again, you know, I think gets lost. You know, there are a lot of people we talk to, and then I'll talk to in general, <clears throat> who have these same critiques, but they blame some kind of dark cabal Illuminati group, right? And if we could just get rid of those people, then everything would be better, right? Well, right. Put, put me in charge and, and I'll fix everything, you know? Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, when really, you know, no matter who you put, into those positions, they're going to fulfill the same role, right? It's the position itself. It's the structure itself that's fundamentally flawed. Right, exactly. And the, uh, the conspiracy theories, or in some cases, like anti-Semitic rhetoric that um, identifies particular people in power as the problem, you know, is, is, uh, is itself one of the things that perpetuates the legitimacy of the institutions themselves. You know, all of the 
you know, you're talking about all this anti-Illuminati stuff as if capitalism w- were a system that would uh, promote life and well-being if only it weren't being held hostage by bad people or something. You know, that's the ultimate, that's the like, that's the last defense of a, of a totally broken system, right? Is that is you just have to change out the, uh, the people operating it. And the, the, you know, the problem of course, is that every generation we, you know, we say, Oh, it's the, it's the people who are in power right now. Let's just replace them. Whether that means electing Obama or in Greece just now, they've just elected Syriza, this radical party that, is supposedly going to fix things, but the, you know, yeah, as you say, the issue is not the, you know, the morality or the ethical fiber of the, of the, the rulers. The issue is that the, the system that they're operating is not broken. It is doing exactly what it is made to do, what it can do, you know, which is concentrating power in fewer and fewer hands. <clears throat> You know, this is some. These are ideas I, I often talk about with people, and the the big argument that that sooner or later comes up is if we were to get rid of that whole dynamic, that whole power dynamic, what's stopping somebody with you know all the resources when when it does go away, or if it did go away, what's stopping someone from just imposing a new order? Well, this is uh, this is the question about the power vacuum, right? Um, now, the and the, this uh, rhetoric about a power vacuum. If you create a power vacuum, somebody will step into it. Is the rhetoric itself is intended to normalize the idea that there are always hierarchies? And if we're going to accept that, that means that we actually have to throw out the idea of equality and freedom entirely. Mm. You know, either. Equality and freedom are possible, and they are things that we can defend, that we can create, uh, you know, or there will always be hierarchies and there's no reason to fight them and we should just hope to get uh, the best possible rulers. Now, I believe and I imagine that most people actually do believe that it is possible to create and promote freedom and equality, that those are, are things that are possible to do. And certainly, at the minimum, that we're on a continuum where you can promote more freedom, uh, more autonomy, or, or promote less. Uh, this rhetoric about, about a power vacuum you know, that, that you brought up, um, it's theoretical, it's hypothetical. It's like, oh, if this happened, what would we do? But, but life is not hypothetical. Life is not theoretical. We are already in a situation in which we can promote liberation in which we can take action that redistributes power or we can lull ourselves to sleep with these sort of bedtime stories about how it's impossible anyway so you know why even try which for me is the purpose that the rhetoric about a a power vacuum serves for you know for me the the project that we are engaged in as revolutionary anarchists is to address Every attempt to concentrate power, every attempt to make self-determination impossible and to, to, to defend ourselves against those attempts, to level the playing field, as it were, uh, which is a project that we engage in today under a government. If the government collapsed tomorrow, it would be our project to prevent some other cabal, some other cadre from imposing its will. It is a project that can last the rest of our lives, no matter what happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's kind of like that old adage. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I don't even know where it comes from, but uh, you know, the the price of liberty is constant vigilance. Sure, that, yeah, that sounds know. like some founding fathers kind of stuff. It does, yeah. You know, that's probably Franklin or uh, you know, uh, one of those guys. But um, but yeah, I mean, that's 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 the adage there. You know. Yeah. I um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do too, you know, and that's the thing, there's no, um, there's no end goal utopia at, at which point everything will be perfect, you know, human relations are always going to be complicated. Right. You know, and I've, I've never heard a serious anarchist uh, say, and certainly in modern times anyway, that there will be some point where we're done. Right. You know, well, because, uh, because anarchism is... Essentially, it's it's a values for engaging with the ongoing problem of how to live. It's not a uh, 
you know, uh, eschatological, how does, what's that word? Eschatology. It's, it's not a, uh, millenarian, uh, promise that the kingdom of heaven will arrive on earth. It is a way to make decisions and, and pursue projects in the here and now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, Patrick. It's funny too, because, you know, you, <clears throat> you look back and I know a big myth that's sort of been driving the current culture, is this whole idea that, you know, humanity is sort of bloody in tooth and claw, and we, we sort of have to duke it out in the market, quote unquote, to sort of that, – that's the only fathomable way that we could have a society function properly. And it's like, you know, modern anthropological research is coming out with evidence that that's just totally, completely flat out wrong. You know, right. our, our ancestors were – if anything, pretty much on the egalitarian side of the spectrum. So it's like we really need to really come to terms with who and what we really are as people and what our roots are. I think that's more, I think that's more of an um, intelligent way to go about uh, remed- remedifying this current situation than looking at some sort of, uh, like you said, eschatolo- eschatological promise in the future. Right. Well, and – you know, as I think David Graeber pointed this out in a, in a conversation, he uh, he said that we've invented at least two ways of ending life on Earth. You know, over the past hundred years, um, now at at that pace, uh, that cannot the way that we are doing things now cannot be the way that things have been done for most of the existence of human beings, or else we wouldn't have made it five hundred thousand years as a species. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, what what is happening there now is clearly a a deviation from the kinds of behavior that make it possible to to survive from one generation to the next. Yeah, absolutely. You know, David Graeber. You know, here's here's a thinker that I I bring up constantly on on this show, probably to people's distraction. But uh, <laughs> if I've encouraged anybody to to read some of his books, I mean, they really should. I, I got into a very heated argument the other day with someone about Hobbes, you know, that quote, Patrick, you, you know, that was, that's a quote from Hobbes. Now here's a philosopher that I just loathe, you know, you know, right, and, right. And I, you know and I refuted this other person um, that I was speaking to by saying, well, you know, if you read Kropotkin and David Graeber, they have such radically different ideas of what uh, human relations have been for the majority of our history. And they actually have like, you know, evidence where Hobbes certainly did not, you know. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, but those are thinkers that people don't, uh, <clears throat> they don't, they don't make it into the mainstream. They don't make it into the uh, the the public consciousness, you know. Whereas Hobbes is taught in every philosophy department across, you know, the Western world. Right, but I don't think it's even. I don't think it's even just a problem of who is taught in the philosophy departments. I think that. The, uh, I think that most people don't conclude what is possible on the basis of their reading in philosophy. I think that most people conclude what is possible on the basis of what they see in their daily lives. And that's why the, the universal imposition of competition and hierarchy as a way of life it has, been, has been successful in uh, uh, truncating our imaginations, you know, in making it difficult for us to imagine that there is anything that we can be except for bloody and tooth and claw, you know, but that, that is a reason for people to engage in anarchist or anarchistic experiments in, in our daily lives here. You know, uh, locally, for example, we have this market that, you know, in which there's no money, no, uh, no bartering or anything. Everybody who comes, you just bring whatever you have to, to give, you put it out, people take it. Um, and then you, you take whatever you want that other people have brought. And it, if you bring something to this market, you know, the first thing that happens is people come and they're eager to help you un- unload things, eager to help you carry things. If somebody needs help putting up a table, or everybody's eager to help them. And so for me, participating in this, and for hundreds of people in, in our little town, uh, we all have a, a firsthand experience that we need not be bloody in tooth and claw, that, that human beings in the right circumstances and with the right uh, – with the right values and the right re- rewards will be uh, naturally you know, com- uh, cooperative and eager to assist each other in things. That's, that's one of the challenges for us 
in such a highly policed and competitive society is to create spaces in which it becomes possible to imagine uh, a peaceful coexistence. And daring to dream dangerously. Yeah. Right. right. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, radically free markets, things like that. You know, it, it's certainly something we talk about here a lot is that, yeah, you need to start building these things in your own communities because, you know, when you're face to face with people, people do tend to behave themselves in a, an anarchistic or communistic manner. You know, you can see that these projects work on these small scales, and that that definitely gives you it 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 gives you the 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 faith and the uh, the drive to experiment with larger and larger projects. You know, it's transformative in the sense that it it challenges your assumptions about what human interactions can be. Right, and it, that goes back to what you were saying at the beginning about learning by doing. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you have to participate to really be able to get it, you know, right. and it becomes it becomes second nature at that point. You know, when you start living that way with a community of people, you know, that it changes the way that you uh, that you look at the world and it, it just gets easier and easier over time. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, um, what do you think of. Um, <laughs> I was actually having a conversation with someone, uh, you know, about this interview, and they were saying, you know, are you going to, are you going to ask about, uh, are you going to ask about the anarcho-capitalists, right? <laughs> and uh, their opinion was, you, you know, well, you you shouldn't talk about family business, <laughs> you know, so save that, save that for our own like circles. But I'm going to ask about the anarcho-capitalists. Mm. Uh, what's what's your um, what's your opinion of people like, you know, Stefan Molyneux? Um, you know, the, 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 the modern and cap and, and certainly, um, the hijacking of the term anarchist by right wing libertarians. Well, I understand why people would want to hijack the term anarchist right now. That's a, a symptom of the moment that we are at, that we are at in political history where the state has become widely discredited. And, you know, few people want to, you know, want to stake their uh, their credibility on being statists at this point. Everybody is trying to figure out how to promote, you know, decentralized or post-state uh, networks and ways of doing things. So the question is whether we will learn from this that uh, not just states, but all forms of hierarchy are the problem or whether we will, you know, transition towards some new way of apportioning power that, that still maintains hierarchies. Um, a friend of mine has joked that if there are anarcho-capitalists, there must also be anarcho-sexists, anarcho-racists. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. and the, the, the meaning of this joke is that capitalism is essentially a hierarchy. You know, mm -hmm. the 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 institution of property is a way of making it possible for there to be unequal power relations in reference to uh, goods and services. Um, if you are a believer in hierarchy, if you if you want there to be some kind of hierarchy, then capitalism is a pretty good one because it's a flexible hierarchy. It's possible to move up and down in the ranks. It's in, in some ways, it is uh, a more versatile and, uh, form of, of hierarchy than, you know, something like feudalism, right? That's why capitalism succeeded feudalism, because if you're a peasant in a feudal society, the only way to solve your problems is to overthrow the society. But if you are a poor person in capitalism, you know, probably you have a better bet of rising in the ranks by out-competing other poor people than you do to overthrow the system, right? This is why... This is why capitalism has has persisted, because it's so it's so flexible, you know. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but it's a hierarchy, and if you are an anarchist and you believe that our ideal society is not one in which there are masters and servants, uh, you know, but but one in which we are surrounded by equals who who can challenge us, who can engage with us on a on a level playing field, like I said, um, then. Uh, really anarcho-capitalism is just like, if you're going to throw out these other hierarchies, why not throw out that one too? And also, incidentally, there's no evidence that capitalism could persist without the state. 
in order to have private property, you have to have, uh, you know, a systematic violent enforcement of, of that system of, of rights, of the apportionment of power around goods and services. And if you don't have that violent systematic enforcement, what you have actually is just anarchism where people have to resolve their conflicts or have them out openly, uh, which is a very different thing than compelling everyone to agree to one notion of how we should relate to material goods. I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, like I completely agree. I, I certainly don't have any, <clears throat> I don't have any illusions that capitalism could exist without a state. Nobody's ever thought that. Like, no, <laughs> you know, even uh, Adam Smith himself didn't think that. Yeah. You, Some you people know. do think it now, which is, I mean, the reason that it's seductive as a, a framework is that, you know, the, uh, okay, when you're critiquing the existent, when you're critiquing the society that you're in and you want your critique to seem legitimate, then you, you cite things that everybody can agree on. So you're like, well, you like property, right? Like, what if we could have property without the state? You know, I mean, that just, that sounds more persuasive to somebody who cannot imagine a society without property, who cannot imagine a society with without capital. And you're like, oh, well, it's, it's just the same as this one, only a little bit different, you know, which is, for me, is just a very different project than what I love about anarchism, which is the, the thought experiment of, of trying to envision a, a radically different way of doing everything. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm sort of curious on that note, how would you, de how would you describe crime think being different from past um, incarnations of anarchism because it seems to me that the the whole crime think way of describing the anarchist appeal uh, it's it's almost like a postmodern anarchism if you want to call mm. it that uh, give me a little bit more to go on what you mean by postmodern I'm curious well you know going back to like let's say uh, Bakunin or Pr Kropotkin you know it just seems that um, you guys really address the sort of existential crisis of our of our modern era a lot more so than they did, obviously. You know, um, that makes yeah. Go, go ahead then. Oh no, but that's pretty much it. You know, I, I feel okay. like that is you take that into account much more than previous uh, uh, anarchist thinkers. Right. S certainly, Bakunin and Kropotkin both thought that anarchism would be the realization of Western civilization. You know, that this is this sort of enlightenment train of thought, which is that uh, we have been progressing and uh, as, as a society, as a species, and that we will arrive at a, a time when human society is perfected. Um, now, uh, crime think projects arise at a very different historical juncture when uh, fortunately, many of us have uh, lost our faith in Western Eurocentric Enlightenment notions of progress, uh, and and are looking outside of this particular sort of uh, imperialist and ethnocentric notion of of what what counts as skills, what counts as as knowledge, what counts as desirable. Um, in, in that regard, I, I think that we have a different framework than Bakunin, Kropotkin, uh, certainly Proudhon, um, many, many of those thinkers. But at the same time, I, I think that we inherit some of the contradictions of their, of their project. You know, they were, they were simultaneously trying to realize and abolish the civilization that they were born into. You know, they thought... If, if we were able to, uh, to, to realize the potential of this Western Enlightenment uh, way of thinking, way of living, um, that potential fully realized would be complete liberation. You know, Bakunin loved Beethoven. You know, he, he, he loved all of these things about the, the society, the, the Western European society that he, uh, that he and Kropotkin sort of idolized from uh, from Eastern Europe, from Russia, you know, um, at the same time as he recognized that 
that the ways that those values, that sort of scientific rationalism uh, had uh, come to pass thus far were, were un- undesirable, actually, were not improvements. You know? In that regard, I mean, Bakunin, actually, I don't want to make him a cartoon character. He, unlike Marx, thought that you could learn a lot from the peasant systems of, of life in, in Russia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marx thought that the peasants were hope, hopelessly backward and there was nothing to learn from them. Everyone had to pass through this sort of phase of proletarianization. And so the, the you know, the revolutions that would, would occur in the most industrialized nations, like, uh, you know, Marx had a lot of faith in Germany. The reward for Marx's faith in Germany was the, the rise of the Nazis, actually. Yeah. If, yeah. You, if you fast forward from 1871, when he expressed his great pleasure that, uh, or no, sorry, 1870, when Marx expressed his great pleasure that, that Germany was going to win the war with France and become the central power in Europe, fast forward from then to the 1930s, you know, we see actually that everywhere along the line where this, this notion of, this Western notion of progress, of industrialization, of these things that were thought it was thought would lead naturally to a, a military, you know, the coming of a millenarian utopia. That actually, that was wrong at at every count, at every step of the way. Whereas somebody like Bakunin uh, or, or Kropotkin, who said, "Let's look at the different instances of cooperation, of mutual aid, of of mutually beneficial coexistence among peoples of all nations and all all times of all of all ethnicities," you know. Uh, people and animals too. In Kropotkin's case, you know that's actually a much more promising uh, vision, and one that that lines up better with with the way that history has played out since the 19th century. So, I I think that y- you're right to identify a contradiction that uh, that anarchist thinkers of that time coming out of Europe were facing, uh, and one that it's easier for us to sort of extricate ourselves from at this historical juncture, but. I'm sure a hundred years hence the the contradictions that we are still locked in will, will be very clear, you know. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, you, you know, I mean, it's it's. <clears throat> I, I I believe firmly more and more that yeah, like most of these philosophies from the last century belong there. I mean, we need entirely yeah. new ways of right, right. You know, a new ways of of thinking, new ways of constructing something positive because the world is very different now, you know, right. and a lot of those ideas have all this baggage associated with them, yeah. you know, um, you know, so taking the good things, you know, from those thinkers and applying it to something new, I think is, is, yeah, I think it's the best way to approach <clears throat> looking at how a future society, um, can organize itself and can it sustain itself. Right. You know, I, mean, I agree a hundred percent. But go ahead. Uh, I'm just uh, you know, we just we we live in a new world now, you know. And Patrick's right when he says our culture, all cultures, capitalist culture globally, is facing an existential crisis. You know, I mean, people feel very isolated and alienated, um, and they you, you know we need something to to fill that isolation. And I think that that is you know mutual aid and. Uh, and and uh, a, a horizontal, you know, way of uh, <clears throat> way of doing things, right? Interacting. Yeah. I I've been reading a lot of history lately for another future project that we're working on, and uh, one of the things that strikes me and always strikes people when they read history is how little has changed, actually. Mm-hmm. How. Uh, how familiar everything is. You, you read about people who are doing exactly the same things, you know, hundreds of years ago that, that you're doing right now. It seems so contemporary, some of the stuff. Um, you know, in that regard, I don't want to be over-optimistic. I think that capitalism has faced crisis after crisis. You know, the, the, the slogan, capitalism is the crisis, is, is not just a slogan. Capitalism has always produced crises and at some points in history uh, has actually advanced and spread as a consequence of the way that people responded to those crises. So, you know, for example, the demand for more horizontality um, has been met 
it, you know, by the, the um, proliferation of, of the internet and social media, which are horizontal, but also keep us integrated into the existing system. So I, I would like to think that the crises and the, and the unfulfillable needs that capitalism produces right now would themselves be enough to, uh, to catalyze a movement for another world. But I, I fear that in, in actuality, we are going to have to take the initiative to bring that about or else the, the future might actually look worse rather than better. Yeah, it, it could look very dystopian. You know, it, that's something that, you know, does give one pause when they're uh, thinking about thinking about these issues. It, it, because, yeah, capitalism has been <clears throat> probably the most resilient economic and social program in human history, uh -huh. you know, in modern human history anyway. And um, it's 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 weathered all these crises and, and, and they do go in and, you know, they'll take radical movements and they will <clears throat> spin it into the existing paradigm. Right. You, you know, so, you know, for example, you know, um, uh, well, punk rock, right? Look at, you know, yeah. the, the, the entire punk movement. Now, first of all, punk rock started as kind of a, a fashion movement in the seventies. If you want to look at the British scene there, right. Right. Malcolm McMillor and who is the owner of a little shop or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a little kink store, a little, you know, yeah. alternative countercultural fashion store, you know, um, years later, of course, now we have punk rock being sold in shopping malls. Right. Nice. Um, so, so that aspect of it was, was marketed, you know, and, 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 even um, uh, well, we're talking about uh, kink. Look at all the little, you know, uh, fetishist shops everywhere, right? Now, yeah. before this was, you know, a truly revolutionary sexual practice, right? People were, you know, liberated, you know, and 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 being able to openly exercise their sexuality, then you market it, right? And then it becomes marketed and and forced down your down your throat put on your Facebook feed, you know, um, you have that with almost everything, right? You know, it's just spun into consumerist culture. You know, the internet's the same. The internet can be a wildly radical tool for organizing and, and learning about new ideas, or it could be something that just sucks up all your time and keeps you passive. Well, the, uh, the example that you make about, uh, kink and sexuality, for example, you know, in a time when, capitalism persisted in part as a consequence of the repression of, uh -huh. of social life, mm -hmm. you know, when it was necessary to have this sort of Protestant work ethic, Calvinism to, to compel people to be productive and to behave themselves. I can understand how in that moment, at that historical juncture, it could seem that this sort of uh, radical free love ethic of the 1960s was genu genuinely rebellious. Mm -hmm. um, but as you say, all of these things can be, uh, have been integrated into the market, you know, in the, in the internet era where we have social media, you know, your, uh, you know, your identity as a, a person who participates in certain fetish communities might even be part of the way that you sell yourself for employment, you know, the, the way that you're able to get hired at a certain bar or something. And, and so it becomes, very difficult to think of of yourself and your your tastes your your activities as something that it can be differentiated from um, all the different selling points that make you a commodity integrated into the market and this is this is the thing about the internet where you're saying it can be a tool or it can be something else mm -hmm. I, the metaphor i would use is that the internet is the new factory floor it's the new, new global factory floor it's the the space that keeps us all available to the market at all times so that our activities can ceaselessly be integrated into the, the flows of capital and commodities. Um, now, that doesn't mean that everything that happens on the Internet is, is bad, but it, it does mean that, like the shop floor 100 years ago, it's the place in, that we have to organize to, uh, to interfere with the ways that power is distributed with the ways that, that commodities and capital flow. Um, and, and that really the internet is not 
of value in and of itself. It's it's you know any more than the the factories a hundred years ago were. I'm not a syndicalist. I wouldn't have been a syndicalist then. You know, the uh, the the way that we have to engage in that space in the in the space of the information superhighway and, and all of us being ceaselessly networked now is is just in a disruptive and transformative way to challenge the power dynamics that that are otherwise reinforced in that space. Um, and I don't think this is a question of tools being neutral. I don't think any tool is neutral. I, it's rather a question of how do we use these these tools that surround us not to reproduce the society that produced them, but to 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 disrupt it, to prevent it from from functioning, so that in the spaces that that creates, we can do something else. This is a different position than, you know, Hart and Negri or some kind of Marxist perspective who, who would say that, you know, capitalism is producing all of the commons that, that simply need to be inherited by communists, you know, that which is, again, the millenarian, old fashioned uh, Marxist, you know, Western progress notion. You know, I, I don't necessarily think that the tools or the structures that our society has produced, I don't know if I think that any of them are valuable as it stands, I think all of them will have to be transformed according to a different logic, according to the logic of what produces the greatest freedom, the greatest capacity for self-determination. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that's I think that's a justifiable criticism of uh, of the communist worldview. They tend to oversimplify context, uh -huh. you know, which is why uh, well, I mean, it's why I'm not a communist. You know what I mean? It's just I, I have too many. But plus, you know, the communists in the last century had the unfortunate habit of, of shooting anarchists when they out outlived their usefulness. Right. <laughs> you know. Well, but the really unfortunate thing was that they they won. Yeah. For them, uh, it was fortunate for the rest of us. We could we could see what was at the end of that trajectory. Uh, you know, but in that regard, it would be I would say that today any party Marxist any state communist. Uh, if, if, if they're a friend of yours, if they're someone that you care about, the best thing that you can do for them is to prevent their party from taking power because you know that after you, they will be the next against the wall. You know, the, the Bolsheviks systematically slaughtered almost everyone who had participated in the 1917 revolution, including the members of the Bolshevik party. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, it's just another reason why those ideologies should stay in the last century. You, right. you know, I mean, they, right. they tried that project many times and it never ended well, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, that's a justifiable, you know, critique, a, a critique of the communist way of, of doing things. And, it, you know, it, it's interesting. I, it, these are complex issues, especially using modern technology and, and uh in the context of, of building a radical society, right? So, oh. I mean, what's, um, <clears throat> I, I, it, it kind of links to me to like alternative economic models, right? I mean, you've got, uh, you know, Bitcoin, et cetera. Um, if you've ever read uh, Charles Eisenstein's Sacred Economics. Uh -huh. I haven't read it, but go on. Okay, okay. Um, but alternative economic models that are not necessarily capitalistic, uh, have you, uh, have you studied any of those things? And like, uh, what, what do you think about alternative economics in, in, you know, in general broad terms? Then? I fear that the, uh, the crime think representative that you have speaking with you tonight is not the best one to, to speak about alternative economic systems. Um, my, my own personal experience in that department is largely experiential. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and and boils down to the notion that we learn by doing. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we are smarter in action than we are in front of a pile of books. Honestly, you know. Um, I know also, uh, you know, Michael Albert put a lot of work into uh, establishing some sort of, uh, you know, alternate economic system. I think it, it could be interesting to draw on all these different things, uh, but this goes back to what I was saying before about, you know, you, you don't want to start compromising with what is familiar just in order to be able to make your point more convincingly, because 
what you want may be something that is utterly unfamiliar. Um, I, you know, I reread uh, Thomas More's Utopia mm -hmm. yeah. last year, and yeah. um, you, you know, there, there are, there's slavery in in this Utopia. Mm -hmm. I think there's even capital punishment. You know, yeah, um, yeah. There, there are all these things that that um, surely Thomas More himself, were he born today and had a had a couple of years to get a sense of himself, would, would just be ashamed of. Um, for me, the 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 most useful economic theory is the theory that is tested in practice. You know, um, mm -hmm. that's why I, I take a little bit more stock, maybe in a sort of a North American anti-intellectual way. Granted, but I, I put more stock in the in the actual local experiments with anti-capitalist uh, circulation of resources than I put in uh, in big books of theory, and in that regard. You know, something like Bitcoin has been a success and something that is useful and instructive, but I'm not sure that Bitcoin itself is our success. I, I imagine that one of the reasons that uh, that anti that you know that anti-state capitalism, that so-called anarcho-capitalism, has uh, has been able to to capture the imaginations of so many people is because of projects like Bitcoin that that demonstrate that it is still possible to create these imbalances and access to resources without a centralized power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, and I certainly agree with the fact that the action, the experiment, the actual doing is of more vital importance than, you know, reading about or trying to build some kind of you know, thought experiment about economics, you know, because um, I, I think you can you can grow a system, you know, of resource development and resource uh, sharing by doing. I think you, you, you can just figure that out by by actually acting upon it. I think that is more, you know, more vital. Right. And there are larger scale examples that we can look to uh, what people are doing in uh you know in the countryside uh of northern syria right now you know in the corpse of in, in the course of a a very difficult uh civil war mm -hmm. yeah um, you know the people there are actually trying to figure out how to have a post-capitalist economy function while fighting uh you know, the Islamic State, ISIS on the one side, and then, you know, on the other side, the, the Syrian regime. Uh, and, you know, Turkey and all the other state actors in the in that area. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. I, personally, I think um, what's going on in that whole region, you, you know, what, um, what people will call Kurdistan, let's say, uh -huh. um, is now more interesting than what's happened in Greece or, or Mexico. Like, I mean, that's kind of like the like the focal point of my interest personally in in terms of large scale anarchist projects that are currently in existence. Um, that's uh, talk a little bit about what are, what are your opinions on the manner in which people are organizing themselves in the area? Well, it's it's hard to speak. Uh, it, I, I'm not speaking on any firsthand information. Mm -hmm. uh, Crime think. Operatives have conducted uh, interviews with Turkish anarchists mm -hmm. who went to Kobane, um, yeah. and, and and at this point, we basically have to take their word for it uh, yeah. and and go on the uh, the reports that people like David Graeber mm -hmm. and um, I can't recall the, the name of the person who is the curator of Bookchin's legacy, but, um, she, uh, yeah. she was there also. Yeah. Um, I saw that. Yeah. But, uh, we kind of have to go on that. Um, I don't know. I mean, what I, what I see from a great distance taking place, there is a sort of a, a grim, uh, glimpse of the future, um, of, of one of the possible futures that, is ahead of us where traditional state actors have pulled out of the region, you know, um, out, 
they've been unable to maintain control, partly because of the, the chaos that has forced Assad's regime to, to sort of withdraw its zone of influence to the, the western end of Syria. Um, you know, the uh, United States is, is not able to send in, like, occupying forces um, on account of what happened in Iraq. And in the, the power vacuum, as you, as you were talking about earlier, that, that results what we see are these uh, these really intense struggles be- between uh, Islamic fundamentalists, you know, organizing in a sort of a para-state or post-state hierarchical fashion um, on the one side, you know, and and then uh, you know, populist, uh, basically horizontal uh, struggles for autonomy on the other side. It, you know, were that to happen. Somewhere else other than the Middle East, the place of ISIS would probably be taken by fascists of some stripe or another. We can certainly imagine it would be fascists in Greece with the Golden Dawn or in Ukraine. Um, in the United States, it would probably be a little bit more complicated than that once again. But, but you know, we can imagine the the scenes from Kobane with you know the refugees and people using scavenged or salvaged weapons to, to fight to create a, an autonomous zone against these, these new post-state hierarchical actors, you know, while the state, you know, bombs whoever it doesn't like that week from the air, you know, whether it's the people they were calling terrorists last week, or in this case, the people they're calling terrorists this week, right? Yeah, um, yeah. It's a, it's a pretty grim glimpse of, of what the future will look like in a in an era of collapsing states um but i think that we can look at that we can compare it with other examples like what's happening in ukraine or what is happening in greece uh and certainly we can figure out if that is the future that is ahead of many parts of the world what do we do, need to be doing right now to maximize the likelihood that that future will play out well that the people that are fighting on behalf of freedom and autonomy will have the resources and the networks that they need to defend themselves. Uh, you know, that, that international solidarity can, can come together in such a way that the uh, YPGs and YPJs of the future, the, you know, the, the, the Kurdish fighting forces will, mm-hmm. you know, will be able to stand up to the, the golden dawns and ISIS's of the future. I think that those are questions we can engage with right now, and it's not—it's not a chiefly military question. It's a—it's a question rather of how ideas and values circulate, which is why we put so much effort with Crime Think Projects into just starting these discussions in the first place. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's the other thing. Uh, the new project to change everything—it's it, being translated pretty heavily, right? I mean, you've, you've got several translations available now. I think. Well. W- you know, the website currently offers six. The video is out now, 12 or 13. Um, but there are 20 languages, uh, 20 translations completed that we're in the process of, of uploading to the website. Um, and we heard from groups in several other parts of the world that are working on their, their translations now as well. Um, Czech Republic, uh, mainland China, uh, two different groups in the Philippines. Um, we, we've heard from comrades in South Africa and even even a group in Tehran, in Iran. So um, the the project came about as a collaboration between collectives distributed all around the world on I think five continents altogether. Um, and for me, that's one of the promising aspects of the of the project speaking of international solidarity you know in a in an era when nationalism violent fascist or quasi fascist nationalism is going to be one of the responses to the the economic crisis and the the collapse of uh, national structures um you know, it is especially important for us to, to use our, our one great advantage, which is that, that we believe in 
international solidarity and and cooperation. So to change everything is an attempt on the micro scale to engage you know, hundreds of thousands of people in these conversations. But on the macro scale, it is also an attempt to interweave those conversations around the world so that we can contribute to this circulation of tactics and momentum and morale that, that has already been taking place, you know, from people in Tahrir Square sending pizza to the folks who are occupying the Capitol building in Madison back in uh, 2011, you know, to uh, the Palestinians tweeting uh, advice to folks in Ferguson about how to deal with the effects of tear gas, to the you know, the expressions of support going back and forth between Brazil and Turkey in summer of 2013. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this is a, this is the, the kind of international cooperation and solidarity that, that we will need in the future. And we're trying to build up the networks and the structures for that right now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fantastic. I mean, it, it, cause it's so plain that there's already <clears throat> an outpouring of, of sympathy among various oppressed people throughout the world. Yeah, like the Zapatistas last year releasing statements in uh in support of <clears throat> Palestinians in, 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 in Gaza. Palestinians who are consistently every time something awful happens in the world, Palestinian people just immediately have this outpouring of, of sympathy and solidarity, which I think is very beautiful. Yeah. Um <clears throat> you know, it, particularly considering you know they have one of the most raw deals <laughs> in the world, you know, um, the level of sympathy that they have for people. You know, I, I remember Palestinian statements um, about, you know, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner in, uh, in the United States. And, you know, uh, it, it, it is just, it's really interesting. And, and to strengthen and build those networks, I think would go a long way, you know, toward building um, a new international solidarity movement. Right. You know, well, but, and the people no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, the people in Palestine who are expressing that solidarity understand that all of these different forms of oppression are interlinked. Yeah. You know, and that it's not a coincidence that the United States is sending its police departments to Israel to receive training, you know, yeah. training, which is, is funded, in fact, by USA to Israel. Um mm-hmm so that they can learn how to engage in these repressive practices and bring them back and, and carry them out on U.S. citizens. All of these different repressive hierarchical structures are, are interlinked, and fighting one of them anywhere uh, should mean fighting all of them everywhere. You know, often it means that people fight in order to establish some new nation states, some new parties, some, some new configuration of power, but the point of to change everything is that if we are able to coordinate the ways that we stand up for ourselves, uh, you know, so that they reinforce each other, then and only then could we can we hope to to op- you know to unlock the, the the possibility of a free world, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it and it reminds me. Yeah, you know, and basically, I know we're getting to time here. Um, the last thing I wanted to really talk about. There's a phrase that really struck me from work, which came out a few years ago. It's, uh, I believe it was work. It's a uh, fight where you stand. Right. Yeah. That's right? at the, that's at the end of, of work. Yeah. You know, and again, you know, work and, and evasion, um, it really it brought me back into the collective's fold. <laughs> you know, those two, those two texts I thought were outstanding. I, I can't recommend those two books enough to people. Um, and I often, give copies to people, loan copies to people. I mean, I, I, I think they're important works. I really do. But, um, but fight where you stand, you know, it, 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 right where you are, anybody listening, there are things that you can do in order to help build this new world, you know, and just to help, uh, <clears throat> just to help build a better world in your community among people that, you know, you know, there are things that you can do, you know, and, and it, it is possible. Right. I mean, and that's the the great, you know, optimistic message, I think, of a lot of the a lot of the analysis. Right. And fight where you stand. What we mean by that is, you know, you're not this. 
broaching all of these subjects, we're not trying to persuade people to engage in a struggle that is outside of them. Actually, you and all of your listeners are already engaged in these struggles, whether we like them or not. Mm-hmm. You know, all, all of us were born into the unfolding struggles that are the result of the crises produced by capitalism, produced by state power. You, you are already fighting against them, whether you like it or not. You have to to survive. Mm-hmm. You know, the the question, the only question then is, how do we engage? Uh, in these struggles, you know, it's not, not a question of how, you know, whether we should fight. The question is how we fight. You know, do we fight just for ourselves, just to advance our place in the pyramid of power, just to get a little tiny bit higher? You know, do we just seek individualistic solutions or do, do we make common cause against them? Do we do something together that makes it possible for us to transform our, our situation? And that's that's something, as I say, that everybody is already involved in these in these struggles the question that we should be discussing in in collective dialogue is how we can do something that will solve them once and for all yeah <clears throat> yeah absolutely you, you know and it's such a it's such a great principle it's a refreshing principle you know why don't you tell listeners about um i don't know it, just some of the things some of the things that they can do Immediately, you know, right now, to uh, to 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 integrate themselves into that that perception, that way of doing things. Huh. That's a that's a good question because I I don't know exactly where most of your listeners are are situated, but I I will say first of all, uh, as I was saying earlier about the the sort of idealistic and and naive energy that produced. Uh, Fighting for Our Lives, our earlier mass outreach project, uh, you don't lack the knowledge or the wherewithal to engage meaningfully in the struggle. It can't be a question of you waiting until you've educated yourself enough or until you've gained more resources, you know, or until you're older and know better or something. Um, Rather... If you, if you take an action from where you're situated in such a way that, you know, that people can see that you are, are combating the authorities and the forms of oppression in your life, that will speak to others who are where you are. You know? um, th- this is not a struggle that should be led by university professors or uh, career protesters who have been in every riot since 1999. Uh, you know, the, if you are not somebody who has participated in any of these struggles or read any of these books, you have that in common with most of the other people whose participation in the struggle will be vital for it to succeed. And speaking from and acting from that position will connect you with those people more effectively than I can connect, for example, with, with people who have a totally different life experience than I do. Speaking myself as a as a, a lifelong participant in these struggles and, you know, a person who, you know, drinks tear gas for breakfast or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so the, the things that, the things that those who have not yet engaged can do are, are the most important things. You know, if you're still sitting on the fence, you getting off the fence is the kind of thing that could catalyze everybody else who's on the fence, you know? So don't underestimate your power, especially if you don't see yourself as a seasoned revolutionary or as a person who's super educated about this stuff. You can create the possibility of the major changes that that you want to see or even changes that you can't yet imagine. You can create that by by your actions. And in every case uh, where some new window of possibility for for humanity has opened up. It's been opened just by the courageous individual actions of people who weren't experts, of people who just acted on their outrage or on their desire for something better. You know, whether we're talking about people taking the streets of Ferguson or, you know, initially occupying the the squares and plazas that that made the Occupy movement kick off, Mm -hmm. you know, the... The secretaries who showed up having never gone camping 
before and, and just like, you know, set up a tent just to see what would happen. Um, the people who were breaking with what was familiar to them, uh, those are the, the really important things. Now, that, as, as you say, the, the challenge is for, for us to be able to come up with some things that we can do. Um, because it, you know, it, it being so difficult to open spaces of possibility, certainly we don't have very many points of reference for what struggle looks like. That's why we, we return ceaselessly to the same, uh, tactics, you know, whether it's breaking windows or getting people to sign petitions, we, we do these things, not necessarily because they work, but just because they're all we can imagine. They're all we can come up with. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have a new panacea that I would try to persuade people to employ, I don't, whether it's, you know, breaking windows or occupying things or, or any of these things. I, I think that what is necessary rather is a way of looking at our lives where we are ceaselessly looking for the point at which we can engage and create a contagious reaction against the forms of oppression around us, you know, it's a, it's a way of looking, looking strategically at the injustices we suffer to see where our, our reaction against them could become something that everyone participates in. So th this means, first of all, that next time, as last November, people are blocking the highway all around the country, you should go and block the highway and, and, and find out, learn by doing, find out what it feels like to do that. You know? mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, talk with the people in your lives figure out what resources you could get access to and, and you could, what, what resources you could do something collective with outside of the logic of capitalism, you know, um, how you could share things, whether that's your creativity, the resources you can smuggle out of the workplace and, and how you can use those for the things that you really believe in, you know, not, not to advance yourself in the market, but to create the possibility of us fulfilling our potential in our own terms. You know, I, I can tell people to engage in a bunch of different kinds of volunteer work, but really I'm most curious what the imaginations of those who have not yet joined this struggle will bring to it. I, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah, I, I, I really can't agree more with that. Fresh, new ideas. I mean, that's really what's needed, you know. And, yeah, and we're counting on, on you, listener, you know, to produce that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and again, you know, this is a point that um, I've seen crime think made in, in a lot of your texts. There, there should be some joy in it. There should be should be some joy in it. You know, it, it, so many times, especially, you know, people who have called themselves activists for a long period of time, you know, you get jaded and bitter and cynical a lot of times. You know, there, there should be sure. some joy in these expressions. Right. We can't be trying to choose between being responsible and doing the things that, that make us happy, actually, because, you know, that's, that will achieve neither of those goals. That will neither make you happy nor, nor, nor responsible. You know, that rather, you should do the things that come naturally to you and that propel you joyously into another way of engaging with the world, which is its own reward. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we are certainly over time. I could probably do another hour. Um, but um, I guess, uh, first of all, uh, you know, to change everything, why don't, you, why don't you give out some contact information and where people can, you know, first of all, find the document that we've been talking about and then, uh, you know, connect with uh, Crime Think as a whole. Okay, that sounds good. You can go to tochangeeverything.com. It's just you know, spelled like it sounds, to change everything.com. Uh, if you go there, you can find the video, you can find this text, uh, you can order uh, free copies of the pamphlet, up to 600 of them, uh, if you want to distribute them where you are. Uh, anything else that you would like to, to learn about that we've been involved in, you can just go to our website, uh, crimethink.com, C R I M E T H I N C.com. And, uh, we also have a podcast for podcast listeners. Mm -hmm. um, and besides that, the really important things, like I said, are, are uh, you know, the, the ways that we would most like to hear people from people is not uh, getting emails asking what is to be done, but rather 
do something where you are, we'll hear about it, and and if it works, we'll we'll ultimately meet in the streets where it counts. So thank you for giving uh, us a platform this evening, and good luck with your your work on the show here. Congratulations on doing it for a year. Thank you, thank you, yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you for joining us. As always, those uh, those addresses will be linked in the description to this podcast. I highly recommend to change everything. If you're on the website, I also recommend work and evasion. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Uh, Crime Think X Workers Collective, Eric Picard, Patrick Ryan, Free Radical Media Podcast.